All right, welcome to week two. Um, as I explained last week, I'll be treating these lectures more as a show and tell. Uh, in other words, I'll go through the various commands and explain what they do and what you'd want to use them for. Um, instead of going through the slideshows, because you guys can read the slideshows as well as I can. Um, I am basing myself on the slideshows in the comments, the sense I'm covering the same commands that are in the slideshows. I'm just going to show you guys how it actually works. Um, you will notice I'm not, it looks like I'm not using VMware, but I am. Uh, VMware is in the background. I'm connected using an SSH terminal so I can make the font bigger and change the colors easily to make it more legible in this room. Um, and the other thing is I've switched up my microphone. Hopefully this one's better than the other one. We'll find out after I go to render this tomorrow morning on whether or not this new headset works better. Uh, it requires a heck of a lot less wires and the microphone seems to be a heck of a lot more sensitive. Which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it could be an interesting thing depending if I don't have my volume level set up properly. I will apologize ahead of time if my video sounds like ma wah 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 Alright, so what are we going to cover today are the very most basic commands that you should know when you're using Linux at the command line. Um, last week I talked about shells very quickly. Um, Linux, unlike Windows, but actually that's not quite the truth either, um, you can pick which shell you're going to use. The shell means what command prompt are you going to be using with your operating system. There are dozens upon dozens of various shells you can find for Linux. The funny thing is, is that pretty much everybody uses Bash. Why? It's been around for over th literally 30 years. And it works. It does what everybody needs it to do. So therefore, if everybody knows how to use Bash, Bash tends to take the lead. Um, there are a few others like ZSH and um, just regular SH doesn't make them any better or any worse, it's just they have different feature sets. So without further ado, I'm going to dive into today's demonstrations. Um, and if you're curious what I'm doing and discussing is I've literally got the slides up on my tablet so I don't miss anything. So you know, if you follow along with the slides, you'll have a good idea of where I am because I'm using the slides. I have technology, I might as well use it. And those that have me for database are going to be shocked. Holy crap, he's actually got to look at a piece of paper. <laughs> okay, so essentially um, what I'm going to discuss first is there's a few ways of finding out what shells are available to you in your operating system. And I'm going to use a command that's not explained yet, but it's explained a little further into the lecture. Uh, the command's called cat. So this shows the following shells are available. sh, dash, bash, and rbash. So these are the four shells that are installed by default with Ubuntu. Um, they offer different features. Uh, basically, sh is the most basic shell, and bash is the one everybody uses. rbash, remember right, is reborn bash, which means they decide to make things a little bit nicer. But everybody ignores it for using bash. And um, Echo shouldn't be a mystery. Uh, if you've seen, if you've done anything in DOS, it's the same as print. So if you've ever written a batch file in DOS, it's the same thing as print. And this Echo shell shows you what shell you're currently using. Uh, later on, we learn about bash scripting. You can actually write your scripts to change its behavior based on what shell is currently active. And you discovered by reading the dollar sign shell dollar sign shells, what's called an environment variable. There's a big pile of variables that are defined in the environment. They define everything from your path to uh, what shell, obviously, you're running, um, what your aliases are, as in have you renamed any commands, that kind of stuff. Um, there's tons of them. And the path is one of the more sensitive ones, and you should not mess with it. Uh, those of you that have had problems in their Java class, then trying to install Postgres after doing certain things in their Java class, discovered what happens when you screw up your path. I've troubleshot several people with that problem. So, you know. Now, each shell has certain things called built-in commands. And the cool thing is, if I type in the word help, 
And you can see I got a full screen full of text here. And I can scroll up and show you guys all these little commands that are built into it. So it's got a bunch of commands that are built into it. And these look almost like programming language commands because they are. They're different functionalities that are basically built into it. And you can see right here, there's your, everybody's favorite while loop. Evaluate is similar to a NIF statement, but not quite. It actually evaluated, runs a command, and then it returns the results. These are different things that are built into it. So that's essentially the basics of Bash, the, the shell itself. There's not much to say about it. Uh, another command that you're going to find useful is clear. Uh, that one's not in the slideshow anywhere. What does clear do? It clears the screen. It's the same thing as CLS on, Win on DOS. Clears the screen. Now there's a few commands we should start exploring at the moment. And the first one I'm going to show you guys, and these are actually out of order in the slides because I don't know why the slides are in this order, but they're in a kind of a strange order. Um, Actually, I'm going to go and do, oh, come on. There we go. Now, one of you guys, you already, just, blah, one you guys already saw before was the password command. Password allows you to change your password. And you, some of you are going to say, well, that's not quite how you did it. You did sudo pass w the root. That meant you were changing the password of the root user. Currently, I'm logged in as root. Thus, I don't need to issue the command that way because root has power. It's basically God mode for Linux. Um, if you can't access something using a root, you're in deep trouble. However, changing your password is a skill you should all know. Uh, why? Because it's good to know how to change your password, especially if somebody stands there and actually figures out what your password is. And when you're a root, you can change the password of any user by simply typing in the username after the command password. And then it prompts you for a new Unix password. And, oh, come on. I didn't want to change my password. However, when you type it in, you guys have had experience already, you type in the new password twice. Now. When you did the sudo thing, it prompted you for your password first. And that's a command that's not in the slides either. Sudo means run as super user. Do this as a super user. It prompts you for your password and then lets you execute the command. Sudo is good to know uh, because certain versions of Linux, such as Ubuntu, insists on not setting your root password off the bat and they want you to do everything as a standard user, issuing everything as a sudo command. It's a pain in the butt um, because you end up having to type, you know, the command sudo all the time, then your password all the time. Uh, there's a timeout on the sudo command. So if you've typed in sudo in a command and then you do something else right afterwards, it'll keep it alive, I think, for about uh, 30 seconds to a minute. It won't keep prompting you for the, for the password for sudo. Um, how does the operating system know you're allowed to run the administrative commands? The first user that gets created in Ubuntu gets added to the admin group right off the bat. Therefore, if you're in the admin group, you can run sudo and pretend you're root. It's a pun, like sudo, but it's sudo. Pretend to be root for this one command. Um, you guys have seen the who am I command. Who am I tells you who you are. Some of you might wonder, well, why do you want to know who you are? If I suddenly become another user, even though, and I'm pointing at my screen, right here, it shows what my username is. Depending on what shell you're using, it doesn't always have the user in front of an at sign, so you don't always know. So who am I is a guaranteed way of knowing who you are right now, logged in as. So if I exit out of this and I go, who am I again, I'm root once again, in and out. So who am I allows you to identify what user you're currently operating as. It doesn't mean what user you're logged in as, it's who you're operating as. That means that's going to be who you're using and whose effective permissions are going to be in place, whose paths are going to be in place. All that stuff is based on who you are, supposedly at this moment. 
host name. Host name is the name of your current machine. Now, there's what is the name of your machine on the current network? It gets pretty important when your system is networked on a, with several other machines. Right now, odds are several of you, your machines are called Ubuntu. And if you're using bridge networking, that means there's a bunch of you with the same computer name sitting on the network, all fighting over whose name this applies to. Usually, you want your host name to be unique on the current network. Uh, you name, yay, tells you you're running Linux. This is a really old command back in the Unix days where people would write scripts and programs and they didn't know what version of Unix was getting installed on. So based on what you name would tell you, it would then um, branch the appropriate installers and put the right bits and pieces. Eh? I do cover more details of uname later. Uname minus A tells you all kinds of other stuff, including what kernel you're running, whether you're running the generic kernel or not. Um, tells you what um, bit set you're running, whether you're running on 32-bit, 64-bit. Uh, tells you which, if it's GNU Linux or some other version of Linux. It also tells you what time it is. Or actually, what time the kernel was built, I should say. Not what time it is, but when was that kernel built. Um, Uname has a bunch of arguments to it. Uh, dash dash help is your friend. If you're not sure what the arguments are, type in a command, then put dash dash help, and it tells you what the arguments are. If I go uname dash s, it's kernel. Dash a is all arguments. Dash m tells me what kind of machine it's running on, x86, 64. In other words, it's running a 64-bit operating system with the x86 command set. In other words, it's running on a 64-bit Intel processor, Intel-compatible processor. It'll tell you the same thing if you're running on an AMD. If you're running on a different architecture, it'll have a different name, like ARM64 or Spark or whatever. Um, the last command, at least of the most basic know what you are, is SU, which you've seen me use already, which is switch user. SU allows you to become another user. And if you're not root, it allows you to become someone else. And if I go SU root, it'll prompt me for the root's password. And now I'm, I'm several layers in. Ah, crap. Now I'm back in. <laughs> so, that's the basic commands of figuring out who you are and what operating system you're running on, uh, that kind of stuff. It's not commands you use on a regular basis. It's just good to know what they are. However, the following commands are commands you'd use on a regular basis. LS. LS is the same. OK, do you guys remember DIR in DOS? Yeah? And right now, I'm sitting where there's no files, really. Uh, I'm in my home directory, which I haven't created any files or directories yet. Um, however, there are several arguments you can give to ls. There's dash a, all. Now you can see there's a few files that are showing up. Those are the dot led files. In Linux, any file name that starts with dot is considered a somewhat hidden file. It's not included with the standard listing. That's why they like using dot as the leader, so that if I go just ls, it looks like there's nothing there. They s tend to save a lot of files and hidden directories that way. So in here, if you look up here, you got your bash history, your bash rc, which is the control file for ba your bash script. Your profile has settings that are specific to your current user's profile. That usually includes any addendums to the path and that kind of stuff. Um, any changes you've made to how commands are listed out, aliases, that kind of stuff. Um, there's also the long, LA. So L is long, A is all. And when you do LA, it shows you on this side, this stuff over here, are the effective permissions. Um, don't remember what the number is off the top of my head. I'll have to get back to you. Who, the, what group owns it? What user owns it? Um, when was the file created? What is the file name? 
And this is the size of the file, theoretically. Um, there's also ls-d, which shows me the user, the file level type directories. And all it does basically is gives you the path. Not the most used. The dash D argument's not that useful, at least not in Linux. Under other operating systems, other Unix-like operating system, D gives you more information than this. However, D is basically a directory. The next command will look familiar to everybody. CD, change directory. There's not a lot of arguments to CD. They either have CD, CD with a path, or CD tilde. Now, if you do just straight up CD, it brings you home. So if you go CD with no arguments, it brings you to your home directory. If you go CD tilde, it brings you home. So CD tilde and just straight up CD do the exact same, the CD do the exact same thing. CD with a path changes directory to that path. If you don't have permissions to get there, it'll complain, sucks to be you. Usually it'll give you permission denied or a path not found depending on how everything is set up. Now, I'm sitting in my root of my file system at the moment. And in here, you'll see a bunch of directories. You see this interesting looking file here, which is actually not a file. It's what's called a symbolic link. This is a short file name that points to a different path. Essentially, it's pointing to the boot image. Uh, some other directories, again, there's a symbolic link here. And you'll notice down here that the TMP directory is highlighted green. This isn't like, if you aren't using a colored shell, you won't have these colors, just saying. Uh, especially if you're using an old style dumb terminal, you definitely won't have these colors. Uh, essentially, what this is saying is that the temp directory is read writable and executable by everyone. Why? Because temp needs to be accessible by everyone because it's a dumping ground. So any program you run, whether you're running it as root, running it as someone else, has to have rights to write to temp. Therefore, temp is the wide open directory. So I'm going to go back home. And there's another command called pwd. And pwd stands for present working directory. It's basically the equivalent of where am I? You know how there's who am I, which tells you who you are? Well, there's no where am I command, but they created one called pwd, which is present working directory. So no matter where you are, if I go pwd, it tells you where you are. It's kind of handy. Um, so, so far you've seen how to navigate through a directory structure quickly using CD. You've seen me list files. So now you can look at, you can find where the files are. You know how to move around a little bit. The next command that you guys should know about is MKDIR. Anybody want to take a guess what MKDIR stands for? Make a directory. Um, Actually, I think it's the same command on DOS. So it's been a while since I've typed DOS commands in. So you know, when I say I think it is, it probably is. I'm going to create a directory called test. Now if I do an ls, you'll see a directory called test. And there's our test directory at the bottom. As you can see, it's read writable by, the, by me. It's readable by the group. And it's readable by the world. The funny thing is, is the world can't get into this directory. So. It's an odd set of permissions, but it works. Um, the other thing I can do also is I can go ah, wrong keystroke. P, not F. P means create the parental structure. In other words, the item of further, most furthest on the right is this one here. That is the child. When you do dash p, it builds the entire tree structure you just defined. So if I were to go, it'll show my present working directory is 
slash root because I'm running as root, so my home directory is root. And I created test2, test child, and another test. And I've got nothing in here. And here's my two files. So we created a directory. Yay. Our MDIR is the opposite. Our MDIR is a little special though. It doesn't let you delete a directory that's not empty. It's a good thing because you could accidentally nuke an entire directory structure without paying attention. And you usually have to give it the full path of what you're trying to delete. In this case, I'm just going to nuke the test directory, which is in my current home directory. Bang, no arguments. However, I can actually nuke the entire tree from top to bottom by, by specifying the entire path. And I do this, and dash p gets rid of the entire tree structure. So if you do an rmdir dash p, parent child, um, it'll get rid of the entire tree structure if there are no files. If there are files in it, I'll show you guys in a minute how to take care of that. I am going to skip the next command. If you're following along in the slides, if you're you know, following where I'm at on the slideshow, I'm going to skip the more command for the moment because I'll be demonstrating it later. Now, the next one is man. Man stands for manual. Man will tell you everything you ever wanted to know about a command. It'll tell you more than you ever wanted to know about the command. So I'm going to tell it, give me the manual for ls. And we can go page by page. That one's not too bad. It's only 224 lines of information. And you can scroll up and down using your up and down arrows. And it'll sh it, the thing about the man files, or the man pages, uh, they're all formatted the same. The first line you'll get is the name of the command. The second one is a synopsis. In other words, what's the, the, the basic syntax? And then the description shows you all the different arguments. Um, essentially, that gives you the choice of how the arguments are displayed. You can do dash a or dash dash all, known as the short arguments or the long arguments. And you can see there's lots of, lots of arguments. There's one command that's useful for you guys. When you're looking at a man file, it's slash. That's not on the slideshow, by the way. Slash is search. If I'm not sure how to make something recursive, and you actually got to type it in right, it'll bring you right straight to things that are recursive. In other words, if you're not sure if you can make, if the command supports recursive, you can open up the man page and search for the word, or part of the word recursive. And it'll bring you right to the right spot, and it shows you the different arguments for it. And it explains what the different options are. And it's Q to quit. Actual fact, let me bring that up again. Because I just pressed H for help in man. You can see all the different commands you can feed into man. It has a couple. Um, how handy are these? Depends on how involved you want to get. Um, but these follow all the same commands as more and less. That there's two commands called more and less. It'll follow the same commands as those. You can move one line back and forth, bring up help, quit, that kind of stuff. Um, but that's essentially man. Info is supposed to be a less formal version of man. And as you can see, it gives you a non-structured version of it. And it's kind of weird because you can skip through it and it'll jump around. And it's page by page. It's a different format. As you can see right now, I'm skipping through all the different commands because I'm searching for the word recursive. It's, personally, I don't like info. It gives you a nice plain English explanation of what it does, but it doesn't actually tell you a whole lot about what it does. 
It gives you, you know, if you think about man as being the command reference, info is like the page you get in a textbook. It even talks about, you know, because it's such a fundamental program, it accumulated many options over the years. It's written in plain English, so it's less formal. Man gets to the point. Now, last week I spoke about absolute paths and relative paths. And essentially the difference between an absolute path and a relative path is when you start listing out your path options, are you including right from the root or are you including from where you are now? So if you're including from where you are now, that means it's a relative path. As in, if I were to create a command called, if I were doing make dear test, what this is a relative path is going, it's going to create the test directory right where I am. However, if I want to do like this, it'll create test at the root because I'm saying starting at the root, which is that first slash right here. Moving on, actually I could go like this. So this is an absolute path. And there's, I keep pointing at this screen like you can see my hand. There, I just highlighted the word test. This command created it from the root temp test, whereas this was um, a relative path as in where are you now? It works as if it assumes you are here now, moving down from where you are. Current directory, downwards. Absolute path means you're starting right from the root of the operating system. So it's if you're going back to DOS, it's as if you're going from C colon something, that's absolute. Or you opened up Explorer and you opened up, you know, my computer and then you go create a file there, that's a relative path. So, you know, if I'm doing the visual exa example, it's the same idea. It's important to know where you are, which is why PWD is so useful. Because when you're working with relative paths, it's entirely possible you'll make a mistake and you'll end up creating a directory structure where you don't want it because you forgot the initial leading slash. So for example, if I'm in my home, my home directory and I go, and that'll complain because that doesn't exist. So if I go create the parental structure, say create a temp directory in my home directory, not as opposed to before where I did this, where it created it from the root. So that's the difference between relative and absolute. Absolute means you're starting from the root. Relative means you're working from your current position. There are two special operators, even though they're not really operators, they're directories. There's dot and dot dot. On DOS, this should ring a bell. If you go cd dot dot, what does that do? Goes up one. If you go cd dot, what does that do? Nothing. Why? Because dot means current directory. Dot dot means parent directory. Yay. Um, there's not much more to it than that. Dot means here. Dot dot means my ancestor. Go back up one. Uh, now the touch command, I'm going to Oh, that was stupid. All right. So I actually covered touch in a bit, but I might as well cover it now because I just put it up on the screen. Touch means yes. Uh, why would you want to use the dot? Uh, because that way you want to make sure you're using relative path. From here, do this. Um, often, it's used usually in scripts, script files to make sure you're operating in the current directory, so to avoid potentials of operating from the root. If you, if you lead with a dot, it means here. So it basically, if you get into the habit of using the dot as your, as your prefix, 
So you go dot slash for everything, as he just said. Uh, and make sure you are where you think you are and not somewhere else. And therefore, it's actually a little bit clearer, especially when you're writing script files, it's a little clearer as to what you're operating on. All right, so now for touch. Touch is a special command. You're literally reaching out and touching your file system. And what does it do is it creates an empty file with whatever name you gave it. Some people are saying, well, how useful is that? Apparently it's very useful. Um, essentially, often it's used to create lock files and those kinds of things. So you need a basic file that is empty, but you need to prove there is a file there to start with. Therefore, you would touch it. If you go to touch a file and you don't have permissions, you'll get an error message. Right now I'm operating as root, so I can touch anything I want. Um, now, there's a few things touch can also do when you touch a file, even if it's empty. You can give it the dash A argument, which does not mean all in this case. It means you're changing the access time. You can actually use the touch command to keep track of when things are done. So for example, you got a script that runs nightly that deletes a bunch of files out of your temp directory, but you want to make sure you know when it ran. You can actually touch a file in your root directory or your home directory that tells you. And all it does is updates the timestamp of that file to tell you this is when this happened. Um, dash C, you can touch a file but not create it. It's just a good way to see if you have permissions to create a file there. So you go touch dash C, whatever you want to call it, including a full path, and if it gives you an error, that means you don't have permissions to touch that file. If you don't get an error message, congratulations, you're allowed to, you know, at least create a file in that location. Um, there's a few other more arguments in here. There's dash M, which lets you change the modification time, that kind of stuff. Let's touch. Now, the reason I touched and created a file called test file is I was going to show you guys how to CP. Anybody want to take a guess what CP stands for? Copy? Somebody said copy. It's copy. As you're starting to see in, in Linux land slash Unix land, they don't like vowels. They're not a fan of vowels. Why? I don't know, but it used to be the computer's really, really slow and you were working on dial-up, you could actually see your keystrokes being transmitted practically. So the less letters you typed in, the faster you got the job done. So CP. First argument is source. Second argument is where is it going? So now I got test file and test file two. Yay. Actually, I'm going to put it in the test directory. So now you'll see I created, I did cp test file to test slash. That's telling it I'm going to move, a copy this file and put it in the test directory. The slash means into a directory. If you don't give it another file name, that means it's going to keep the current file name. So if I do it like this, you'll see the test file got copied in there. And test files here also. So you'll see under test here, it's got test file and a couple of other directories, that kind of stuff in here. Now, if you want to copy, you can also go like this. If you, after the slash for the directory, if you give it an argument that doesn't end with a slash, it's assuming you want to give it a new name. So you're copying the file and giving it a new name. It's a bit like when you go into Windows and you go copy, paste a file into the same directory and it puts it copy of. It allows you to rename the file or rename the destination file at the same time. Um, there's a few useful arguments it has. Um, CP-I. I stands for interactive. It says, are you sure you want to overwrite the destination file? So if the file already exists, it's going to say, you sure you want to do this? Yes. Dash B creates a backup of the file. And you'll see right here, 
where I was copying his other test file, it created the same file with a tilde at the end. The tilde is the backup file, it's a temporary file. So it takes the, the file that's there before, copies it, gives it a new name by tacking on a tilde, and then it copies the file, the new file in. It's a go good way to make sure you don't nuke your file contents. Um, there's dash u, which right now is not going to be very useful for me to demonstrate. U means only the new files. So if you got two files with the same name, one is older than the other, it'll keep the contents of the new one, the newest one. Um, dash r, recursive copy, copies the entire directory structure. It's pretty straightforward. Um, dash p, it appends the parental structure to it. A bit like how we had the make directory with dash p, it'll add the parental directory structure to it. Other than that, that's pretty much all there is to cp. Just you're copying files. Now, after cp, you've got mv. And we want to take a guess what mv stands for. Move, like a cow. Yes, you're going to move the file. And it takes almost the same directory, uh, the arguments as CP. Uh, you got I for interactive, B for backup, and U is only keep newest. So if you're going to move one file and overwrite another file with it, if you use dash U, it'll only keep the newest copy of it. So currently in my home directory, I've got test, test file, test file 2, and temp. So I'm going to move test file and rename it to test file 3. There we go. That helps if you don't include the command twice. <coughs> MV moves the file. So if I were to do an LS now, you'll see that test file is gone because I moved it. You know how in DOS you've got a command, com command called rename? You've got a command called move? You've got a command called copy? Copy is pretty much the same as copy on Linux, except it's a little less powerful. Move is basically, it moves a file and rename renames a file under Linux and Unix-like operating systems. Move and rename is the same thing. So you're moving the file and you're renaming it. So that means you can either move it, keep its name, move it, and rename it while you're at it. So I could move test file 3 into test, into my test directory. And now you can see that test file 3 is gone. But now you can find it under test file 3. Theoretically, yes. Um, yes, assuming there's not enough room, uh, move does, literally does that. But under um, Linux, it depends. Um, there's a few things it does. And the first one it'll do is if you're just moving the file and you're not changing the file system it's on, what it does is it actually rewrites what's called an inode. So there's basically hidden information on the file system and it's basically changing in the inode where that file's located. I'm simplifying what's actually happening, but basically inside its, its directory structure, like even though you look at directory structure, it has a hidden set of information that hides that has more information, it actually just rewrites the current path to the file. If you're moving it to the destination, to a different file system, it'll tr attempt to copy the file over. If it successfully does it, then it deletes the old file. That's exactly what DOS does. Um, and there's a few other weird combinations of things it does also. Um, and it, like I said, it has the same arguments as um, copy. I is for interactive. In other words, it'll prompt you to, before it starts overwriting files. B, it'll create a backup of the file, including this with the tilde. And U, it'll only keep the latest file. So that's move. Um, there's not much more to move other than that. Uh, if you're curious exactly if everything move does, of course, you can always go man move. And you'll see a couple of other arguments I didn't speak about. Uh, F is force. In other words, it'll move the file whether you want it to or not. 
In other words, it'll move it, overwrite the file, not even ask you, even it'll even keep, if the file you're copying is older than the new file, it'll actually overwrite it with whatever you're sending in, so it forces the overwrite. Um, no clobber means you're not allowed to overwrite the existing file. In other words, you're, you're attempting to copy the file in, or you're moving the file in, but you don't know if the file's there or not, and regardless, you always want to keep the file that's already there. No clobber means it'll ignore the file you're trying to copy, because it already exists. Um, Update means only keep the newest, if the file is newer. Verbose explains what's be happening. So if I go, it keeps the original date and it modifies a lot, the, the, the uh, um, access date. When you first create the file, it creates the created date and the modified date's the same. When you move it, it keeps the created date and it changes the modified date which is the same, basically the, almost the same date as the access date. It uses the last modified date to determine what's newer. Or if the file was created and the created date is newer than any dates at the destination, it keeps, whatever file's got the newest date is what it uses. There's some logic. Oh no, it checks all the different dates. Um, I'm going to do the verbose here, which is, m there, it tells you to move this file. So if you moved a bunch of files, it would show you that it moved a bunch of files. If I had a bunch of files to move in that directory, which I don't, but, you know. Now, now that we've created directories, removed directories, we've created, touched a file, we copied some files, we moved some files, the next one is a really handy command. It's called cat. And I don't remember what cat stands for. No. No, it's not concatenate. Maybe. I don't remember what cat stands for. I've just, I've used cat for years and I've never actually asked what it stands for. Actually, hang on. We can ask the man file. Yeah, concatenate files. Yeah, so it does concatenate but it prints the results to the screen. So it takes all the files. If you give it more than one argument, it'll list all the files together. Um, so, oh, that's stupid. So I'm using the example they have on, um, on the slides. So the FS tab is the file system control file. It tells the operating system what file systems are available to it. And Basically, cat outputs the content. So it takes the contents of the file, outputs it to the screen. So if you fed it multiple files, it'll put in all the files one after another. So if I scroll up, you'll see there's the FS tab here. And then suddenly, the password file is here. And these aren't real passwords. That the passwords are stored elsewhere. Don't get too excited. But it does show you who belongs to what groups, though. And it does show you the usernames, which is, you know, a start. Uh, touch, I already covered. Um, Ubuntu, well, Linux has a useful command called tree. You have to actually manually install it. It's not installed by default. If anybody here has actually used real Unix, you've experienced tree, because most Unix operating systems have it. Linux, for some unknown reason, does not give it to you by default. And if I were to go, actually I'll do it right here. Tree gives you a tree structure. It shows you what's in there. It has a few arguments. Tree dash A. It's the same arguments as LS. All files. Tree dash D. Give me only the directories. So from the wherever path you feed it, it just gives you the directory structure. So if I did tree dash D etc, it shows you the entirety of the etc directory. Um, It, 
it does have some useful com it does have some useful some uses. Um, normally, if you're working with a really complex directory structure and you need to see how the child directories are, then they'll get. Let's say it's a uh, you got a full size tree going down. Sometimes it's useful to actually see how everything where everything is. So theoretically, you could. And I'm gonna. He's gonna know what I'm gonna say here. But what I'm what I'm referring to, but I'll explain some of the stuff later. I could tree then grep for a file for a directory structure, and therefore it gives you the, the tree structure based on where you're looking for. It's useful. It's not the most useful, but it's sort of useful. Um, oh yeah, that's what it is. Dash L says, I only want two layers deep instead of three. You can tell it only go down so many steps. It, it's a little, it has a little bit more fly flexibility than LS, uh, but it doesn't show you permissions. It doesn't show you access dates. It just shows you a graphical representation of the file structure from whatever path you fed it. So that's ls, and that's tree. The next happy one, and this one, did you guys learn about output redirection when you were doing DOS? No. Great. Yeah, uh, everything in... Um, Pretty much everything you're doing in the command line in Linux, you'll probably want to redirect your output at some point. So what's kind of cool um, with Linux is anything that outputs to the screen. So as I just output it to the screen, you can take anything that's being output and send it somewhere else. So there's a few different redirect arguments. And the first one is... Greater than. I had to remember which one it was. It was in the crocodile. <laughs> Somebody might notice I was doing the crocodile. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the greater than. And so I'm going to do greater than files. As you see, no output actually went to the screen. However, I can go cat files, and there's an actual file that contains everything inside of it. Everything I just took the, direct, the output redirected to a file, it's handy. The other one is two of those, and that is append. One is overwrite, two is add to it. So if I do this, and I go like this now, we got it twice. There's one. There's two. There's three. And you can just keep building it up. Often you'll use this for log files as you're keeping track of all your outputs. Um, depending if you're moving a lot of files around and you want to keep track. So for example, you're using the MV command. You could actually tell it to be verbose so you can see all the files that are being moved, but you could redirect all that output to a file so then you can parse it later on to see what's in there. There are some options you can set for your shell. And essentially, it's called the no clobber options, which is often used with redirect. Um, there's a few different choices you have on how you want to turn it on. Uh, essentially, you use the set command, and you can go, and it helps if you don't type it wrong. So you're going to set the option no clobber. Or you can also go dash C, which is also, you know, no clobber. And you can reverse it by turning C back on, which is now you're allowed to clobber. And you can go plus option, no clobber, which reverses no clobber. Uh, if you're curious what the commands are, that's on the slideshow. Essentially what it does, it doesn't allow you, if you use just the overwrite, in other words, re redirect output and overwrite, which is a single greater than sign. If you have no clobber turned on, it won't overwrite the file. It's pretty much what that is. However, by far the most useful redirect command, 
which is one of my favorites. Pipe. If you guys don't know what pipe is, and I don't know what your keyboard layout out because most laptops keyboards suck. For me, it's right above the enter key. It's the backslash and there's a pipe above it. If you're on a Mac, I'm sorry, I have no idea. Uh, you're missing half your keyboard as it is. <laughs> eh? The pipe. Oh, congratulations. I said I don't know where it is. You're missing half your keys. You're not missing that one, but I just don't know where it is. Is it actually in the same spot above the entry key? It's where? <laughs> that, yeah, okay. No. Uh, definitely not. Yeah. So pipe means take the output of the command and redirect it to another program. So there's a useful command called more. More allows you to page through output. And there's a command called less. Less is also more. No, well, literally, it's the same command. They just gave it two names, less and more. They do the exact same thing. Apparently, less has a few more argu uh, arguments than, than more. But apparently, less is more. Less does more than more. Um, somebody felt clever when they came up with that. So I'm going to ls etc. By the way, I'm going to just actually run it as is right now and go bang. So as you can see, there's a lot of files in my etc directory. It doesn't fit all on one screen. But if I were to go repipe through more, it's actually doing single line. Fun. And now I can page through it one screen at a time. I'm pressing the, the, the space bar. Um, you can also search <coughs> using the typical the slash command, which is like you could in man. And you can search for commands, except it won't highlight anything. Yay. And so I can search for the word cron. Pipe is the best, because you can pipe one command to another command to another command to another command. And by the time you're done playing with them, you've done all kinds of magic. Um, yeah, after you've experimented for a long time. Now, So I took a really big file, and I'm taking the contents of the really big file because I want to look through it. And by the way, if you're curious what the, all this is, these are the kernel messages when your computer boots up. These are all the messages that come out. That, that's basically the debugging messages for your kernel. Um, that's what the message is. But as you can see, I can cat into more. I can also go. Um, you'll learn about grep later in the term, term, but a grep allows you to search for a string. So I can take the contents of ETC, pipe it to grep, and say I'm looking for the word cron. And it only outputs the files with cron, or the directories with cron. In actual fact, I could actually output more. I could tell it where, what line it's on. There's all kinds of cute tricks you can do with, uh, with grep, but you know, it outputs the matches using, so redirect is a great tool. Instead of going, because you could go ls, redirect to, like that, and then I could go, right, or you can just literally search for what you're looking for. There's all kinds of tools you can do. They all do the same, similar things. Um, now, in the slideshow, it talks about changing your prompts. I'll actually let you guys experiment with that on your own. Um, it's worth experimenting with, but honestly, the default prompt is usually the one you want anyways. So there's two arguments. There's the 
PS1 argument, which you can feed, uh, which is your primary uh, user prompt. And there's also a secondary user prompt where if you were to type in a command like this, where I put a, a backslash means I'm going to keep typing on another line, pretend to insert a carriage return here or escape the carriage return, you can modify this also. So you can change your prompts as you want. user host working directory. That's the default user prompt. If you want to have a nice short prompt, you could just go current user. Or if all you ever want is where am I, you don't care about the rest, you can do this. And right now it's not going to take, but there's a spot to modify it. What the heck did I do? Did I break it? There we go. Ah, oh, piss off. I'll have to experiment with it again and record it separately. I did play with it yesterday and I had it working. Now I don't remember what the hell I did. Um, the joy of this is not something I play with on a regular basis. Which is always embarrassing when somebody asks me to show it and then I can't get it work. Um, Oh, it's not set. There you go. So now you've got a short little prompt, which actually looks really weird when you're used to uh, the long prompt. It's not harder to read when you're used to it. It's just, what do you like to see? OK, now. Another useful command is WC, and that's called word count. Uh, word count does literally what you think it would do. <laughs> that's the water closet. It's where we go to output information. That's kind of crap. That's garbage. Now, word count counts um, how many new lines, how many words, and what the byte count is. So how many, basically, how many characters there are, how many character turns there are, how many words. Uh, you can feed it some arguments that says, just give me the words, the word count. Um, you can say just how many lines there are. Or you can tell it, tell me how many characters there are. Now what it does is it gives you a number and then the file name. So if I were to go I can give it two files as arguments and now I'm counting um, actually let's go with number of lines. In the file called files there's 33 lines. In the etc files file there's 229 lines for a total of 262 lines total. Um, WC is often used to uh, count how many output, like when you open a command and you redirect the output to a file, you can use it to count how many lines there are in there. Sometimes you want to know how many lines there are in a CSV file. So you guys might have experienced CSV files in your database class, maybe, uh, maybe not, depending who your teacher was. Um, and often it'd be, well, how many lines are in this deal, what would you do? You'd open up an Excel, scroll right to the bottom, you'd open up a Notepad++, and either get clever and read the, the, uh, the, the footer of the application or actually scroll to the end and see how many lines are inside of it. Uh, with In uh, Unix-like operating systems, you've got the WC command, which lets you count uh, how many lines. You can tell it to count how many words, or you can tell it how many characters. And by characters, it includes everything. 
printable, non-printable characters, carriage returns, uh, new lines, tabs, those all count as characters. So a tab is one character. Carriage return is one character. A new line is a character. So if you're using Windows style carriage returns, that means that every time you hit enter, it's two characters. Carriage return, new line. On Linux, it's one. Because the carriage return is the same thing as a new line. Sometimes. Now, earlier I sh you guys saw a cat. And the cat's also got a tail and a head. Tail shows you the last n number of entries in a file. Just what happens is that my files folder is not big enough. Uh, if I do this one, let's go. So it shows the one, two, three, four, five, last 10 lines. Um, you can give it a number argument, which says it show me only this many lines. Tail is really, really handy. Um, because the most useful part of tail, when head has the same commands, is F. And um, this was a little hard to do, but uh, F means follow. And it might be challenging. Actually, I wonder if I can get it to do it. That's what I'm about to do. Uh, can I do? St yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. There we go. Okay. So right now on my left pane, I've got the I'm tailing files, and I've got the F option, which is follow. Do you notice what just happened on this side? It's showing you the content of the file, and as you're adding contents to the file, it's outputting an ad, it's showing you the contents of the file. Now, usually at this point, and actually we had a guy at work that wasn't very comfortable, and Linux asked me all the time, because he could see me, I was constantly going tail dash f slash var log httpd slash error dot log. And he goes, why are you doing that? Because I'm trying to figure out where there's an error in the code, and it's actually causing a fatal exception, which means that my debugger's not capturing it, but the error log is capturing where it blew up. So therefore, I was running a follow on it, so as I was walking through, I could catch the moment it died, and I could actually watch it happen. And you can get even more clever than this, because, you know, piping is the best thing ever. So I'm going to tail it, I'm going to follow, but I'm only going to search for whenever it says X11. So if I were to go, so now it's only changing, showing me the changes that I care about as I go. That's yeah, a cute trick, isn't it? Then you could, output, you could pipe that through said and actually output some other file. Uh, there's a bunch of other commands. You could keep piping commands into other commands. But this is, this is a cute trick that a lot of people that have been using Linux don't know about. If you're dealing with really busy files, like huge files that are con like on a web server, which I'm about to go do something I shouldn't be doing, but that's okay. Connecting to work. <laughs> Uh, um, no, let's go with this one here. 
the heck is it? There's just a few, uh, oh, this one's good. Uh, I'm not seeding. I'm trying to cat it. A cat tail. So I just accessed our website. Now you can see that it updated right here. So. We can actually watch real time. Oh, this is the college's I outbound IP address, just in case you're curious. <laughs> oh, that's somebody else that's accessing that. So with tail, it's kind of handy. Um, now I could do this and now go. So let's say I just want to keep track of Access from here, which actual fact I think if I remember it, access only keeps the first the first time you hit it. Uh, if I had an error message, it would pop up on there. So yeah, well you can actually track for a specific IP address. So you can watch an IP address walking through your website. It's kind of cool. It's handy. So for those that didn't know you could do things like that, it's a really handy tool. You can. Um, And you know, right now I'm, I'm right now I'm tailing the log file for our ERP system. We don't use SAP; we use a system called OpenERP, which is now called Udo. Now called Odo, Udo or Odoo or something. And theoretically, I could watch everything that's happening on the server through the log files. And if you grep, you can just pay attention to certain things. Where I could grep just for the error messages whenever there's an error, I can capture the error. So it's really handy when you're debugging. Because um, this is the thing that's written in Python and it really sucks to debug. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. But that's why you have head. Yes. If you wanted to, yes. Theoretically, you could go tail. Like that. Hey? Well, yeah, then you'd do this. Um, but theoretically, actually, no, that one there will be dead. There'll be no output going to the screen. But it will capture the results as you mentioned. And you know that's one of the handy redirects. Um, some of the other con file content commands, uh, head, which shows you the first 10 lines or the first five lines as specified, it's the opposite of tail. It watches the top of the file. Uh, because you've got some programs, instead of appending to the end of the file, it appends to the top of the file. It does a reverse. Um, more, you've seen, less is more. It does the exact same thing as, as more. Cat, you've seen. And because somebody thought they were really clever, they came up with TAC. What does TAC do? Reverse order of cat. It's cat backwards. Last file first, or last entry first. Reverse the, the file. And some people like reversing the file because then they want to go. 
So you can take it and reverse the, the, the contents and I'll put it to another directory, uh, into another file, which is kind of cool. It's just one of those things. If you are, um, honestly, I don't know. <laughs> I was really trying to come up with a good reason, and I'm sure there's a really good reason why you'd want to use TAC. Uh, odds are when you're bash scripting, you may want to use it so that maybe you want to grab um, the last modified file and the one that was before modified in reverse order. So you could reverse the order of the last set of modified files so you could work through them in reverse order. So you could reverse the order of the, fi the files and created date. So if you sorted the files by created date, output it to a file, reverse the order so you can operate from newest to oldest. That's your imagination. You get to use your imagination. Um, there's the cut command. And cut is a little dangerous. Cut allows you to strip text out of files. Um, literally, like cut and paste. It's, you can identify the delimiter. You can tell it which field. So if it's a file that's got tabs, so if I go uh, cat. So you can see right here that there's different sets of entries in here. So if I call this F1, if I go cut, oh man, I hope I get this right. No, 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 definitely not. I, can't, I don't know if it's using tabs or... Not qu that's an interesting combination of what it chose to do, but it demonstrated what I was trying to achieve, uh, <laughs> but not quite what I was after. Um, Apparently, that's the definition of one tab. And essentially, it's, you can use a colon for delimiter. Uh, so if you've got a comma so delimited file, you could actually say commas are delimited. F tells you which column you want to keep. F1, comma, F whatever. Um, It doesn't damage the file. It just outputs it to the terminal. And now it's showing me the usernames in the ETC folder. Um, I could tell it to give me fields one and three, which is, if I remember right, your user group ID. So it's a cute trick. Um, the, once again, if I just go cat, this file is colon delimited field one is the first column. Field three is your user ID. Field two is your group ID. Um, the next one shows you uh, the person's nice name. So if I said uh, one, two, three, four, five. But yeah, when you create a uh, user on Linux, it creates a user group with the same, that user's name. That's how it is. But that's what cut does. Now, yeah, there's a command called paste. Because, you know, what would be cut without paste? Now, I'm bad. I haven't installed VI on my machine yet. So I've got two files, F1 and F2. If I go paste, F, paste, F1, F2, it does the opposite of cut. It glues the files together line by line. So it matches up starting at line one. It takes the contents of the first line and glues on the contents of line one from file two, row by row. So. It has a few arguments. Duh. If I go this and I go, 
Look at this, I just made a CSV file. Ha! For those of you that played with CSV files in Kumari's class, you remember how much fun that, that is. Ha! <laughs> that was a different ha. Huh? Be thankful. Um, yes, you can use, theoretically, Theoretically, and I, I, I'm not sure if I can do it off the top of my head. Eh? Hey? What do you mean? How do you output that to what I'm doing to a file? That's called using VI. Um, that's a different lecture. I just did it, yes, but I did like the two simplest command. I added something and I saved it. The actual fact, if you look at the hybrids, there's a whole series of hybrids on VI, on Vim, actually, which is VI improved. That's why it's called Vim. VI improved. Is it improved? Yes, it supports color coding. Ready for the pain. VI is the best. Every, oh no, I, I used it for my for a job, like for my living for like a year and a half. VI is the best editor on earth. Yes, but I've never seen another program where I can globally search and replace case insensitive across every file I currently have open and re output the, f the file in one command. It's magic. It's also voodoo, and you're probably going to sacrifice chickens at midnight while dancing naked in the woods to actually get it to work the way you want it to. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, so I showed you guys how to use paste. It's a great way to create CSV files. I've shown you how to use cut, which allows you to separate files. So if I just say, actually, if I did, hang on, if I did this and then go, uh, oh, cool. Cut does not take... Redirect input. There we go. I just learned something. That was odd. Um, cut insists on having a file. Oh. Uh, not that I saw when I looked at the help file, but I bet I can go. Uh oh. No. Not letting me. I'm sure there's a trick. I don't remember off the top of my head. There's one more way of doing IO redirect, and it's standard in, and I just don't remember what the heck the standard in is. Um, I don't remember what the syntax is off the top of my head. But yes, I tried to do something I shouldn't have tried. Now, some of you have seen me type in this command, history. So when you're doing your assignments, or your labs, I should say, because you don't have assignments in this class, and you don't remember what command you ran. History. It's great, especially for those of you that, you know, were working, for example, in your database class and you closed your SQL editor and then you lost all your commands and then you go <laughs> uh, Or, you know, you're running a Mac and it goes bong. Oh no! The, even the no the the, the Mac the new Mac still do it, uh, just not as often. It's a bad it's a bad moment. Uh, <laughs> uh, usually, bong means you're going to you're going to the Apple Store. Um, however, you can pull back your entire history um, of every command you ran. It's actually stored in a file in your home directory. In a file called Bash History. So if you type in the word command history, it just shows you the contents of that file. It's the same thing except it doesn't give you the numbers if you actually look at the contents of it. History has a few other arguments. You can give it dash C. It clears your history. You definitely don't want to type that in if you haven't finished your lab yet. Just saying. Um, there's a few other things you can do. Uh, you can change 
um, an environment variable called hist file. So you can change where your history file is contained and what it's called. Um, you can also change something called hist size. Hist size is how many commands is it planning to remember? Hist file says, where am I saving it? So you can actually give yourself a history file of whatever name you want to give it. Yeah, I don't want you guys, I don't want you guys getting lazy. But anyways, it's the tab key he's talking about. Yes, I am. The tab key. The tab key is autocomplete. Just so you know. You can use it to autocomplete commands, you can use the autocomplete file names, you can use the autocomplete directories. Tab is life. Um, an actual fact, if you're using one of the old shells, not bash, but one of the older shells, tab doesn't do anything. Tab's a bash thing. And a ZSH thing. And the R, R bash has it. But standard SH, if I remember, does not have it. Um, now, pardon? Yeah, yeah, depending on which, yeah. Uh, the, I'm, I'm emulating a Linux terminal, so it's going to use the Linux commands. Now, the last one that's kind of handy, well, not the last, but one of the handy ones, is exclamation mark. Exclamation mark is also known as bang. If you go bang and feed it a number, it'll rerun whatever command you had in your history. So if I go bang 244, it'll run whatever command I had 244. Now, how do you know what that was? You go history, and you go bang 220. Nine, oops, no space, and there's my, so I don't have to retype the entire big command. I can just go, what was that command again? Uh, and then you can just go exclamation mark number. Um, so that's basically how you play with your history. One of the last ones is which, and basically put, there's a path. And like I said, those of you you had a bad experience in Java class because you cooked your path um, because you, the instructions were not obvious and clear. Where it, it didn't, it says change your path to to this. It just says make sure your path includes this. Uh, where we had entire users wipe out their entire path, and then nothing worked after that. Um, Linux has a path. And it shows you the path where it's looking for stuff. Where's it going to go get the stuff? The, um, however, sometimes you don't know where a command's coming from. There's a command called which. And it tells you which version of CP is it going to use. Because sometimes in Linux, you'll have the same command in more than one place. So therefore, when you use which, it shows you which one is it going to use. And it'll go usually. Um, from left to right in the path. So if it's found in user local bin, before it's found in bin, it'll use that one first. Um, if you do which dash A, which in this case, there's only one copy of that, it'll show you all the places that command is found. Then there's where is. So which is which command am I using? Which which versions command am I using? You got where is, which of course if I give it CP, it shows you everywhere where it finds CP. There's the command CP and the man page for CP. There's not much else to say about where is. <laughs> where is it? Uh, you can tell it to just search for binary files. So in other words, you just want to find the commands, or if you just want to know 
Where's the man page? Or you could only search for sources if you have sources installed. Um, now, oh, that's cute. They've already done this alias. So there's one last command that's kind of handy. It's called alias. Now, it's not like alias in database, but it is. Um, it isn't as in, in the sense of you're just not renaming an object for the runtime of the command. You are renaming a command for the length of the session. And if you include the alias inside your, your RC file, which is your basically your, your, your basic settings for your shell, you can rename certain commands permanently. For example, I'm going to create call, one called MLS. And that didn't work. Don't f stupid spaces. I like spacing things out so it's easy for you guys to read, but apparently it doesn't want to let me cooperate. So I created a command called MLS. What does MLS do? It's ls-la, so I don't have to type the whole thing in. It's a short. Now, I can, uh, I can give ls a new alias, so every time I run ls, it always gives me the long version of it. So you don't have to keep remembering to type in the full path. You can set your default features for the given command by giving it a new alias with new arguments. And let's say you don't want to do that anymore. You can unalias. So now my ls becomes the old version of ls. Okay. So, that is all the commands I'm supposed to show you guys today. It's a lot of commands. They're all on the slides. It's all memorization. Um, and I'm hoping it, it recorded, which it did. So, it's, it's been an hour 27 minutes of me typing crap in. 